negativity. But you won't ever hear that. I'm honored to have the privilege to welcome to our campus this morning our representative to Washington, Congressman Robin Beard. As a member of Phi Beta Lambda and a citizen of our nation, I'm concerned with the erosion of the ideals of free enterprise. Phi Beta Lambda's project awareness tries to get across the point that our country could not enjoy our current levels of freedom and wealth without business, labor, and consumers having the freedom to choose their economic destiny. I know of no better person to tell you the story of free enterprise than Robin Beard. Let, re re let me relate to you for a moment a story. I've had the pleasure during the last two elections to be on a caravan with a group of Robin Beard supporters who campaigned with the congressman the weekend before the election. One particular experience I remember was in Somerville in West Tennessee. Robin was going around the square meeting everyone when, in an old abandoned gas station, we saw our opponent, I've already forgotten his name, talking to a group of 10 or 15 of his followers who were already going to vote for him, and Robin was still going around the square talking to everyone. Phi Beta Lambda is proud to have as a guest, a person who will take the news of free enterprise to the people of Somerville, Murray County, Tennessee, and America. I give to you our Congressman, Robin Beard. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, and I, I'm missing a couple of votes today. We were not supposed to be in session in the last minute. Somebody said maybe we better stay in session on Friday because the people might think we're not doing our job. But to me, the best, the time when you can really rest easy and feel a little bit somewhat secure is when Congress is out of session. Don't ever complain about all the vacations we take. I'm kind of a strange duck talking about campaigning in a district. I've, my district's a pretty long, large, tremendous district, and it's a Democratic district. And I'm one of the few Republicans kind of left from the uh, onslaught. Uh, and it's rough. My district's hardcore Democrat, as a matter of fact. Out of the five counties in the state of Tennessee that went for George McGovern, uh, three of those counties are in my district. And I'll never forget when I ran the, the second time, Mr. Tim Schaefer, I don't know if y'all remember Tim Schaefer, that he ran against me and he, uh, he tried something unique. He to show that he was sensitive to the farmers' problems and also to the consumers' problems, he started carrying a little pig around. As a matter of fact, he brought it to Columbia State, if I'm not mistaken, and carried this little pig around, but he didn't know a whole lot about pigs because he didn't realize that they tend to grow quite quickly, and this pig put on about 100 pounds in the next couple of months, and uh, it was kind of uncomfortable, but he was going around offering $500 reward for my billboard of the year before. And the year before, the two years before, I'd run when Richard Nixon ran. And there was me and Richard Nixon on the same billboard together, arm in arm, saying, we'll be there. And he went around throughout the entire district offering a $500 reward for that billboard of Robin Beard and Richard Nixon. He didn't get any because I was going around behind him offering a $1,000 reward. <laughs> he, people asked me, they said, you know, Robin, as a Republican, when I was running that time as a Republican with in the biggest Democratic district, one of the biggest Democratic districts in the state, uh, with Watergate, inflation, the energy crisis, how in the world do you ever sleep at night? And I told him, I, you know, I really had no problem. As a matter of fact, I sleep just like a baby. I sleep for an hour and I cry for an hour. <laughs> but I was fortunate, I got reelected. Uh, it's an enjoyable job, it's a frustrating job. I don't know all the answers. Anytime you ever find a politician that comes up here and seems to have all the answers, you better put your hand on your billfold. Uh, it's shocking to find out that today that you're elected to Congress, a bolt of lightning does not come down and strike you and turn you into a superhuman being. Uh, I don't even know all the problems. And what's really frustrating for me is the fact that there's so much going on and there's so many directions you've got to go in that Really, you do well just to keep up from day to day in preparation for that day's legislation that's coming onto the floor of the House. But we, some way or somehow, our system has worked. I am concerned, <clears throat> and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our free enterprise system, and especially to the young people, because you're the people that are going to get hit with what we're doing. You know, and yet people don't react, and this is what just amazes me is how 
we get away with some of the stunts we get away with and nobody really reacts. I'm just amazed people are not absolutely out and out mad at us. And yet nobody reacts. I don't understand. I hear the problems about unemployment, I hear the problems about high cost, and I hear this, and I hear we're going to put cost controls here, and we're going to create more federal jobs there. But I never hear, and just think back, and whenever you watch a politician, see if he ever uses the word productivity in his vocabulary, in his talk. See if he ever comes out and says one of the best ways that we can solve the problems facing this country today is to try to do something that will help increase productivity. But you won't ever hear that. What you hear is that the way we solve the problems, forget the free enterprise system, we know it's imperfect, but it's been pretty successful, but we have got a better way, and that better way is we're going to let the federal government answer all the problems. Now, what causes inflation, which is probably one of our biggest problems? I'm not sure what an overall definition of inflation is, but one I found that made some sense. Inflation is where you throw new dollars into an economy where productivity remains the same. Now, that's pretty simplistic. And I'm sure it wouldn't cover the whole gamut, but that's the one I can understand, where you throw new dollars into an economy where productivity remains the same. Productivity. Now, how does a government, what does a government do on increased productivity? Well, one way is we have come out and said we're going to create a lot of federal jobs. Unemployment's a very serious problem. Now, I'm against unemployment. And that's a real gutsy stand on my part. I, Robin Beard, am against unemployment. Boy, he took a stand. And the answer is the way we're going to solve unemployment is we're going to pass a bill for a couple of billion dollars and we're going to create federal jobs and put everybody to work. Isn't that simple? But it hasn't worked. We've tried it. Do you realize these federal work jobs that we create that where we might pay somebody seven to eight to nine thousand dollars are costing almost twenty five thousand dollars per job? The average life of these jobs is six to seven, eight months. And after the federal program ends and here are the people back on the streets again, they're still lost, they're still unemployed, we've spent billions of dollars, and nothing's happened. We've got the Humphreys Hawkins Full Employment Bill. That is a beautiful title, Full Employment. It gives a mandate. One of the things that gives a mandate to the government, or did before it was watered down somewhat, to provide federal jobs for all the unemployed. And yet you go out on the streets and you ask anybody, do you think the federal government's too big? And they'd say, you better believe it. It needs to be cut. It's too big. Too many employees. Cut it back. It's my tax dollar. And yet our answer to you in representing you is we're going to create more federal jobs. And these federal jobs, where do they help productivity? I don't see it. I'd like to try something different, just for kicks. And I think this would be good for discussion. And maybe I'm being too simplistic again, but we've tried the government approach. Why don't we go back to the old free enterprise system, the private sector, just for kicks? What if we said, OK, small businessman, the guy that's got this little grocery store down here, if you hire one of the unemployed and you pay them the minimum wage when it's $3 an hour, we'll give you a tax credit of a dollar an hour. We'll give you a tax credit. Well, you'd be amazed. All of a sudden, people would start hiring some people because they're getting a tax credit. All of a sudden, they'd hire them and put them in the private sector in a meaningful job. And it would be much cheaper. People say, well, look at the revenue we'd lose to the government. But that's a lot cheaper than paying over $20,000 a year for a government make-work job because of all the administrative costs, etc. Or why don't we, in the urban areas, rather than continue to pour billions and billions of dollars and say, okay, minorities, okay, uh, unemployed whites, you know, 
We're sensitive to your needs, and what we're going to do is throw a whole lot of federal money in there, and we'll build you some more housing projects, and we'll keep the welfare dollars coming in and the food stamps, and, you know, everything's going to be okay. Because the hardcore unemployed, the hardcore unemployed blacks and whites, they don't see this, a lot of this public service job money. You know who sees it? The nephew or the brother-in-law or the state representative or the, the county court or whatever the case may be. But the guy that really needs it, they don't see it. But what if they just went to this urban area and said where all the small businesses have moved out because tax rates have gone up and say, all right, small businessman, you come in here and you set up your little dry cleaning shop and what we're going to do is give you a five-year moratorium on property taxes. Now, you'll have people say, now, wait a minute. We can't afford to lose that kind of revenue from our, from our taxes. But what revenue? You know, you've got urban areas that are dying on the vine because all the small businessmen have moved out. They've moved out. And so there you've got a lot of unemployed that are just losing all their self-incentive and pride because there's nowhere to go to work, and so all they've got coming in are federal welfare dollars. Why don't we do something to encourage somebody to start a small business and say, we'll give you a five-year tax moratorium if you'll set up a business. Just try it for kicks. We've tried the other route and it hadn't worked. Our unemployment rolls, our welfare rolls are higher than when we started this federal business. Let's just try this for once. Now the consumer protection bill, that's another answer. Now that's a pretty sounding bill and you know people might be shocked and say you are very insensitive to the consumer. How can anyone be against consumer protection? The House of Representatives just defeated it. I would hope that you would take the time when pieces of legislation come up there that sh and you're shocked to find out that your representative or your senator is against it. I hope you take the time to write and say, why? Why aren't you willing to protect the consumer? Well, the point is, we've got I don't know how many agencies right now trying to protect the consumer, and I don't know if the consumer can afford much more protection. I don't know who is going to be that super consumer up there that's going to decide what's best for you or me. And in this particular piece of legislation, in every single sentence of the bill, there were points of litigation to, where if, to the point that someone walks into their little mom and pop country store in Nolensville or wherever, and there's only one brand of green beans on the, on the shelves, if they really want to take the bill to the extremes, they could say, they're discriminating against my rights as a consumer. I have no choice. I'm going to sue you. Well, I just don't think the small businessman can afford much more of this. And it ends up costing the consumer. And so I don't see anything that's helping to increase productivity in this consumer protection bill. Then we have this wonderful legislation called OSHA. Occupational Safety and the Health Act. Now the concept is good. The concept is good to try to provide job safety. But as a result of a nice little simple law that Congress passed, the bureaucrats in Washington turned that little law into 17 feet of regulations. 17 feet high. That's three times more, I mean that's up there than I am standing there. 17 feet, they pay some guy 600 bucks a month after a three or four month training period and say, you go into the foundries, you go into the mechanic shops, you go here and tell them how to prevent jobs. And what do they end up doing? They go into a factory and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to find you because your fire extinguisher is not at eye level. The guy said, who's eye level? Mine or my wife's? You know, just a little petty harassment. What we've done is we've passed all these bills with good intent. We've turned it over to federal bureaucratic agencies up in Washington who never leave their office in many cases. And they sit up there and write regulations and restrictions every day that is literally driving the small businessman out. I mean, and you see it and it happens. The little mom and pop grocery store that doesn't have two restrooms in it for men and women. You know, the guy and his wife is there, and they, and they come in and say, you've got to have a men and women's restroom. Well, he can't afford that kind of investment. 
We just seem to every day be intent on trying to discourage somebody from starting their own little business. I look at common sight as picketing as another thing that we tried to pass. It does nothing to encourage productivity, but once again, the government comes in, and what this does, common sight is picketing. This was strictly the leadership of organized labor, and it would have, and the rank and file who I talk with and get along with a lot better, they were against it. Common side is picketing. What that would mean, let's say they were building Columbia State University and you had thousands of people building, the plumbers, electricians, the carpenters, the masonry, thousands, all these different subcontractors. And one subcontractor has a disagreement on wages with his employer and employees. They go on strike. If the common side is picketing bill had been passed, they could have closed down the whole site and then everybody would have been unemployed. Now, I think that's ridiculous. And I see where that does nothing to help increase productivity. But that was one of the answers that we tried to come up with. So I look at these different bills, environmental protection, we needed it, but it's gone to the extreme in some areas, and I could go on and on and on. They're going to, OSHA wants to tell the farmers he's got to have outdoor toilet facilities in his fields. Boy, that's insane. An outdoor toilet facility out in the back 40, you got to be kidding me. But see these little guys up there, some of them up there just have nothing else to do except dream up all this, this stuff and it feels like, makes them feel like they're doing their job. But every time they dream up a regulation or restriction, it's going to cost somebody. And all I ask, and I'm considered a hardcore conservative and, and sometimes unimaginative, but why don't we sit back and look at some of that legislation that we've passed that's gone nationwide and try to reform some of it? Why don't we look at OSHA, try to reform it, cut out some of the ridiculous regulations to where industry and the OSHA people work together in trying to create good job safety? Why don't we just try to reform and, and have oversight hearings on that legislation which we've already passed? But no, we go forward and pass more nationwide legislation that just complicates it more and more. I don't know why people aren't upset or why people don't get mad and I look out in this audience and I see the young men and women who in the near future are going to be out and trying to work for a living and trying to raise a family and going to be trying to buy a home. Well, lots of luck. And this is where I feel an extreme sense of remorse and guilt because we are going to make it extremely difficult for you. It wasn't that many years ago that we had a deficit of $3 billion. We spent $3 billion more than we took in in the federal government. Not too many years ago. And all the editorials came out and said, my gosh, the economy is going down the drain. We spent $3 billion more than we took in. Last year, we spent $60 billion more. This year, we could have a budget deficit as high as $80 billion. And what is really, and I don't understand why people just don't get outraged, is that the president is going to have to ask Congress to increase the national debt ceiling this year to probably $871 billion. We owe $871 billion. 15% of that is owned by foreign countries. We pay foreign countries $7 billion in interest for the money we borrowed. We've just increased your Social Security taxes. That's going to be such a burden in two years when you get out and you start working and you look at your paycheck, you wait. The biggest thing that's going to hit you right in the face is Social Security taxes. It's the biggest, heaviest tax that you could ever dream of. And you start trying to set some of that money aside and it's not going to be, there's not going to be any way. And when the government has an $871 billion deficit, let me just ask or just see if you, I don't know if you totally understand what that means. But do you realize they have to go out on the private money sector and borrow the money from the savings and loans? They have to borrow it from the banks? 
And the government each year now is borrowing up to 65 to 70 percent of all the consumer's credit available. In other words, before anybody else gets a shot at it, the government, because they didn't have the guts enough to say no to some of these programs, the government goes out, borrows the money from the banks, the savings and loans, and all of a sudden, 65 to 70 percent of all the available borrowing money is gone. So here you go, just got your college degree, and you walk out, and you're going to start a little shop, a little store, a little agency or something, and you go to the bank and say, hey, I want to borrow some money. I want to start a little business. As a matter of fact, I think I'll even employ a couple of people. Say, I'm sorry, son, but you're a financial, you don't really have a financial record, and money's tight. You know, money's awfully tight, and so really the only people we're loaning money to are people that have real good collateral are the people who have already got it made, that have already uh, got it socked away, and the successful people. So the guy that's trying to start on his own, he doesn't get it. And so he doesn't get to hire those two extra people. Or he doesn't, have to, he doesn't get a chance to really experience the opportunities in the free enterprise system. Because we spent $80 billion more this year and $60 billion more last year than we took in. That's irresponsible. And the American people should say, we demand better. But nobody does. Nobody says anything about it. We could vote for everything coming down the pike. $100 million for highway beautification. Nice program, but is it a priority? You know, right on down the line. So that's the thing that concerns me. The free enterprise system and the government have got to work together. The government cannot do it by itself because it's run, the government's run by a bunch of people who have never had to fill out a profit and loss statement or a payroll or don't know what it is to have to go and, and, and do the actual things that are required in making a business successful. They make a mistake and their paycheck keeps coming in. I don't say this in a negative way toward all federal employees. They're not. They're great. A lot of them are great, but I mean, it's just a system that's happened. These are some of my concerns. They should be some of your concerns because you're going to be right in the middle of it. Everything we're doing today, you're going to have to live with. And I think it's time you start asking some questions. As a matter of fact, I think this might be a good time to stop trying to outguess what you might have on your mind before I close up and see, do we have any questions? Anybody got anything on their mind they'd like to throw at me? It's a lot cheaper than a long-distance phone call. What's yes. Yes, If you remember, though, I said the concept of OSHA is good. The intent of the legislation was good. What we have done, though, is once we passed that legislation, we gave it over to the people in the, in the Department of Labor, at which time they wrote 17 feet of regulations. Then we throw these 17 feet of regulations on these employees down here who went to a, a quick school whose requirements are maybe a high school degree, and they're given these 17 feet of regulations and said, okay, go out and enforce them. And so I guess the point I'm trying to make is it's impossible. They're give, Peter's principal walks in the door with them. And so what my point is, the concept is good, the intent of the legislation was good, but it's gotten out of hand, and I think Congress has a responsibility of going back, reforming and refining the legislation to where it gears, gears in on the key intent, and that's to, to uh, provide and to encourage stronger safety habits and features in the place of business. And that's, you know, so that's my feeling, and maybe if I didn't come across that way, that's what I meant to say. Good. Yes. I'm sorry, 10, well, I just put it this way, 
who's gonna, who do you want sitting up there to say, okay, uh, two of this is enough, and so nobody else can get involved, and so these two guys get to play their little games or whatever. I, I don't know. I, I'm just, uh, I feel that if a guy, if I feel like I can go in and, and buck heads with five other guys, then I want the opportunity to go in and knowing that I may lose my shirt, but I'm going to give it a go. And I don't want anybody up in Washington saying, sorry, you can't do that because we've already, uh, these two slots have already been used. Uh, the free enterprise system is an imperfect system, but for crying out loud, look around. Look around and you won't find one that's better, even with all its little imperfections. And uh, if you look at, if you think the government needs to get more involved, look at, great, look at Great Britain right now. Great Britain is going down the financial tube. They are hurting. They have nationalized this, nationalized that. They have just destroyed any incentive because of the high tax rate. They've destroyed any incentive for the free enterprise system or the small businessman. And they are, just, they are just literally going down the tube. And so, you know, if that guy's willing to take that chance to go out and sell that product, and there's eight others out there, and uh, by doing it, he's going to try to maybe cut the cost so that he can appeal to that consumer, then I'm for him because I'm ready to go buy his product if he can cut that cost. Yes? Well... <clears throat> there's no easy button to push that it's going to say, all right, all of a sudden my views are going to be known and it's going to make a difference. I see so many people throwing their hands up, though, and saying, what good's it going to do? I see many people voting for a person because he's got Democrat in front of his name or Republican in front of his name. Uh, I, I don't see that in the younger generation. I see them asking more questions. But the first thing you can do, and is not to get turned off by the political system, because believe it or not, there are, there are a lot of good people that are literally, honestly, trying to do a good job. Now, we've got some bums that abuse their responsibility, but, uh, you know, that's, those are the ones you're going to read about. But what do you do when two guys are running for state representative, or, or running for Congress, or running for the Senate? Well, in the past, I'd say the majority of the people say, well, he's a Democrat, or he's a Republican, so I'm going to vote for him. Or they'll say, boy, he looks nice on television. He's got a sweet smile. Or they'll say, gosh, at Rotary Club, he, that was the cutest joke I've ever heard. Anybody with that, that's that clever, I'm going to vote for. Or they'll hear their aunt say, I remember John's mother's sister-in-law who I went to school with. And so I'm going to vote for him. And yet nobody or very few people take the time to say, I wonder, how, I wonder how he feels on capital punishment. I wonder how he feels on property taxes or education. Or I wonder how he feels on whatever the major issues of the day may be. How many people have ever, and like your families, I wonder how many of them have ever really asked questions of a candidate. And I think they really have the responsibility to. You've only got one vote in the House of Representatives, and you dang well better be, have some idea of how it's going to be used. You only got one vote in the state house in representatives, and you better find out if he's going to be ready to vote for higher taxes or if he's going to vote for this or that before it's too late. And so the first thing you do is you go and you find out what the basic philosophies are or, or just some kind of get some answers from these candidates. You go down to their campaign headquarters and say, look, I'm trying to decide who to support. I want to know how he feels on this. Then after that, you go to work for that person that you decide best represents your feelings, that you think would be the most effective. You knock on doors, you do the whole ball game. And then you watch him when he gets up there. The day that I think nobody's watching me, old human nature will catch up with me, and Robin Beard, you'll lose me to the Potomac River. There's some people like to lose me there now. But, you know, but then so many times people say, well, I voted and I quit. They won't write letters, and people will say, well, what good will a letter do? And I'll tell you, it surely won't do any good if you don't write it. You're not going to lose anything by writing a letter. You're not going to be doing, lose anything by calling the office, the district office, and saying, I am asking that Robin Beard support this or vote against that, and I'm displeased with this vote or that vote. 
Now, I'm not saying that's going to make a difference. I'm not saying that that's going to really make an immediate difference and you're going to feel like, well, it's not doing any good. But if you're not doing it, then that means somebody else that disagrees with you possibly is filling that void. And we've got to start somewhere. And the best place to start is, first of all, picking that candidate that you really feel best represents your views rather than just voting for him for some reason other than what his philosophy is. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Right. Right. Well, I'm not, you know, my, uh, I've had good training for this question because my brother-in-law is a teacher in Iowa and he's the top negotiator for the, the Iowa Education Association and uh, I've stopped inviting him to my house for Christmas because we end up getting a debate on this thing. Uh, TEA, uh, the leadership of TEA has not been too fond of me either. I had a meeting with them uh, because I have voted against many of the educational bills. And I guess one of the reasons why I have is a, is a matter of principle to the point of, of protest. I'm just getting somewhat fed up when I see more dollars going to pay for the salaries of the people in Washington who administer the education program more money to go in to pay their salaries than goes to the whole state of Tennessee. I'm getting upset when I hear superintendents or principals or whatever who receive these federal dollars that come down with the regulations, the restrictions, and even though their priority may be on one other thing, their real priority is they need another seventh grade teacher, but the dollars that they're getting in, they don't really need them, but they really don't want to refuse them. And I've had principals tell me they've got to lie or almost stretch the truth so that they don't lose these federal dollars. Now my point is, is I think it's absolutely absurd for us to send our money up to there and let it, the cream be taken off the top to pay these people that have never stepped foot in a classroom, that don't know what it is to come down to Hornwall, Tennessee or Columbia or to go into Houston County and see a, third, a, a junior in high school class sitting in the boiler room and they're up there writing regulations that you have to hire drug addicts and alcoholics and you have to do this and you have to have that and you've got to hire this extra person to fill out all these forms and regulations, all the restrictions. I say I think the money should stay here. And I just, the more money, they keep saying we need more money. Well, the money goes and they hire more bureaucrats, they hire more federal employees, who write more regulations, and that's not solving our educational program. Someday, somebody's going to have to say, let's leave the money down here. Why don't we have a revenue sharing program? Why don't we do a, more of a revenue sharing type program where the local counties, where the local state system can make decisions on what their priorities are? But that's one of the reasons. And it, you know, that's, and, and apparently it's not acceptable, but it's just a matter of I do not think, I think we can run our school systems better down here and I'm just kind of fed up with a lot of the waste that's going on up there. Despite the shift, exactly. And, and I've probably done that on several occasions, and I. See, it's got to stop. It's just got to stop somewhere, and I don't know. And I, I guess I, you know, maybe I'm just very unimaginative, but I just. I just, uh, 
I, f I heard in one state where the, the border regents, the cost are more, it takes more to support the border regents than it did one of their two largest universities in the whole state. That's absolutely insane. And you're the ones paying for it, and you're the ones that are losing out on it. I understand the frustration. It's frustrating for me. We could probably knock heads on it all day. You're living with it. I'm up there living with that. And maybe every now and then it would be good for us to change places and maybe it would help me and maybe it would help me understand your situation and you understand mine. Yes, sir. Hopefully, I would, you know, the White House has become not that important because the good Lord himself could be sitting there as President of the United States and as Congress that authorizes and appropriates every single program and dollar, and uh, that's where we really need to place some emphasis on. Uh, Republicans have taken some beatings. As a matter of fact, I, I was planning on introducing an amendment to the Endangered Species Act because in looking around, I found there were uh, a, a lot more snail darters and pearly mussels than there are Republicans, and I think we should be placed on the endangered species. We're going to have to get our message across. We have been extremely unimaginative. We are associated with the fat cat and uh, uh, the, the country club jet set. Uh, I, I've heard so many people say Republicans don't care about the working man. Well, that really... That really upsets me because it's the working guy that's going out and working 40 hours a week and making a paycheck and trying to raise his family and make house payments. It's that working guy who can't afford to have taxes increased, who can't afford to have prices continue to go up. And so every time we vote against or try to, try to say, let's show some, show some control or restraint, fiscal restraint on some pieces of legislation, that may not be total priorities at this time, uh, we are abused as being uh, unimaginative or negative. Uh, you're about right. It's, uh, we have to react negatively. Uh, for example, uh, there's no way a Republican can get a bill through right now. Uh, you come out with a beautiful plan and you put it out like we put out a tax cut plan three years ago, two years ago, a big healthy tax cut, 30% tax cut. President Kennedy did it back in 1962, and it did more to stimulate the economy than anything that's ever happened. Created jobs, the, it, it was eliminated our deficit with a 30% tax cut. So we said, all right, we need that. Let's try it. Let's let people have more in their pockets, go out and make their decision on how they want to spend their money, rather than the government spending it for them. And the Democratic leadership shot us down, and the Democrats in Congress voted against it something like eight different times. And so then, when they increased the Social Security taxes so high, President Carter comes out on the other side and says, I'm going to give you a tax cut. I've come up with this program, and I'm going to give you a tax cut. I'm going to take a little here, a lot there, and I'm going to give you a little bit back to try to pacify you because you're going to be in for a shock, people, in about two years. And when you look at it, most people in this country are going to be ended up paying more taxes in two years because of the increase in Social Security. It's a very frustrating. We try to, uh, we've been very unimaginative. We've tried to make our message across. We have been negative. We're going to have to come up with some positive ideas or positive approaches on job unemployment. And I think one of them is this tax credit to the small businessman, uh, trying to get that across, saying let's try that rather than creating more public jobs, uh, giving a tax moratorium to the small businessman who's going to go in and start a job in an urban area, maybe show some flexibility on different areas of the country, uh, some legislation for urban areas versus some legislation for rural areas increasing the tax exemption for the small farmer or the people out in the rural area that 
When they inherit it, uh, they can deduct up to $250,000 or $300,000 so they can maintain their farm. I guess we just, and hopefully the press will help us out someday, but we don't, we have a pretty rough time getting the message across. I think we're going to have to either that or take things like Medicaid out of it and let it be paid for by general revenues. Or so, uh, see, we did nothing to reform the system. All we did is we reacted to the Social Security crisis and paid more money. And then in a couple of years, we're going to be right faced with the same problem. We're going to have to increase taxes. What we did, Congress in 1972 increased the benefits by 30 percent with no uh, attached uh, income producing legislation. And politically, boy, that's great. We're going to give you 30% increase, and it's not going to cost anybody anything. But then it caught up with us this year. Uh, when Social Security was first developed, you had seven working people contributing to it, uh, and the ratio was seven working people to one recipient. There were seven people were working, they were contrib contributing to Social Security, and one guy was on the other end receiving. Now, the ratio is down to uh, something like three to one. And that gets to be a pretty unhealthy ratio, especially when you're one of those three. You tend to pay a lot more. I'm sorry, I'll get you right. Yes. My stand on the current Equal Rights Amendment. Well, I think it's probably one of the most overblown issues in the country because there are laws on the book covering every single aspect of discrimination at this time uh, whether it be through credit, uh, job opportunity, or whatever. And uh, I just think that the states have had the chance to ratify. I would vote against extension of time for ratification. Uh, I think the seven years has been long enough. I think we've, you know, the people have had their opportunity to talk, and at the end of this year, I think it should be over with. I just don't think it's an important piece of legislation. I think it's strictly a form for the Bella Abzugs of the world. And I don't think she represents the majority. There's legislation, there's laws on the books that covers every uh, individual now, and uh, I just see no need for it. Yes? Well, we, we, you know, we have, right at this time, we have quite a few agencies that are involved in policing business to date. I think the greatest threat as to uh, almost every state, as a matter of fact, has a consumer agency. Uh, you have, I mean, you have a forum. There are forums for the consumer now to go to on uh, businesses being policed quite a bit by so many different agencies and checks and balances, it's unbelievable. They get caught and, you know, there's no perfect way to keep them totally clean. There's some that are going to abuse their responsibility. And I think one of the ways they do need to be prepared to be penalized quite heavily. I think one of the greatest things, I voted, uh, one of the greatest abuses that business come up with is the, uh, the plan with the free enterprise system to the point of monopolistic uh, price fixing. I voted that I th for extra money for the Department of Justice for areas that uh, are involved in that. And I also voted for the extent for severe fines up to a million dollars or more of companies. Uh, rather than just giving them a slap on the hand, we need to literally burn them bad if they're caught abusing the system. But what, what happens on the consumer protection bill is that it's the way it was written, the, un, the points of litigation in every single sentence. I mean, that, there were points, and it's uh, very technical, and it'd be very difficult to describe it to you now, but I'd like you to see a copy of that bill. I'd like you to write me to get a copy of the bill and look at the writing, and you'd see some of the real dangerous points to where it's not the big boy that gets burned. 
It's the little guy that really suffers, who can't afford an attorney or who's sitting there and doesn't really understand it all and can't keep up with it all that, uh, that gets forced out of business. And Well, we have come up with some other legislation that uh, never gets through, but uh, I've, I've submitted pieces of legislation on different issues that will be taken. And, uh, for example, one piece of legislation that I came up with, that, and when you're in the minority, they'll, you'll submit it in the committee, and somebody sees it on the other side, and if they like it, they'll change a word in it and then resubmit it, and uh, usually they'll, they'll be the ones who have the piece of legislation go through. Uh, it, why haven't I submitted a piece of legislation? Yes. Yes. Well, I think one of the first mistakes is the fact that uh, a lot of these problems were not uh, worked out before they went public with it. In other words, I think the president should have spent a great deal more time with the leadership of the, especially the committees who handle the energy legislation and, and getting a lot of the, the rough spots smoothed out. Without any question, a lot of times it becomes politically motivated. Uh, you might have somebody who sits behind closed doors and said, okay, we'll concede this point, let's work this out, and we'll, you know, we'll accept it. Uh, but then all of a sudden you have a senator from Texas that happens to be on that committee, or Louisiana, and when it's all public and, and Carter comes out and says this, and then the next thing this senator knows, he's walking around and somebody sticks a microphone in front of his face and says, President Carter has just stated that his energy bill will contain continued regulation, and we'd like to know your reaction on this. Well, he locks himself into a corner. Everybody gets locked into a corner because he reacts politically. And he says, absolutely not, and blah, blah, blah. There is, when you deal with something this major, this significant, and you got 435 members just in the House, and I, it was amazing. What a shock it was when I got up to Congress and found out everybody didn't agree with me, that people had different ideas, that people came from different backgrounds. It's been a real education. And when you've got 435 of them trying to agree on anything, and when a lot of those people are lawyers who will spend three hours debating one word, uh, it's amazing that we ever do come up with a piece of legislation. The major issue on this is the Carter program, they say, all right, I don't know if I want to vote for that because he's asked for a seven cent tax at the wellhead and a five or six cent tax at the gasoline pump. So that means my people are going to be paying 12, 13 cents more a gallon. Or you'll have a group saying that deregulation, we've tried the regulation bit, we need to encourage additional incentives to go out and, and uh, explore. A lot of people who philosophically believe in deregulation, as I do, with a section in there to cover windfall profits. And yet, President Carter, when he was two weeks before the election, wrote a letter to the oil convention totally supporting deregulation because of the free enterprise system, law of supply and demand. We, and he said, I will pledge you to work with Congress, as President Ford was unable to do, to deregulate. And then he came and changed his mind. Well, that's his prerogative. But I don't think he should accuse those of us who philosophically say, well, let's at least give it a try. If it doesn't work, then we can change it next year. Uh, I think it's uh, unfair of him to accuse those of selling out to the big oil boys, which, by the way, then makes it even rougher to work out a happy compromise because he's offended a bunch of people then. And then it's a matter of uh, whatever, personal pride or whatever. A lot of people are asking. It's tragic we don't have one. I don't know when we're going to have one. I don't know what, who's going to give in first. I think the president uh, probably will, because I think the Senate is somewhat locked into their position now. 
I think the president will possibly come out with some type of, uh, some form of deregulation possibly. I don't know. But I've heard rumors that he may be leaning that way with some good, strong checks and balances in there. And I think there should be those checks and balances. Okay. Well, let me, in closing, I... See, I always start my statements off by saying I don't know all the answers so that you don't expect me to know all the answers when you ask me, and it's quite obvious to you now that I don't know all the answers. Uh, I've just got some gut feelings. Whether they're wrong or right, I don't know, but in many cases, that's all I got to go by. Uh, I, I get extremely uh, discouraged up there because every day, everything, I mean, problems you wouldn't know existed, that I never knew existed, hit you. And you want to throw your hands up and just say, you know, what good is it going to do? Or I quit. All these insurmountable problems will never make it. But I just say this in closing. The thing that kind of keeps me going is 200 years from now, or 200 years ago, I bet it was a pretty heavy group sitting around when they were trying to decide, representing the 13 colonies, whether they should make the break from the mother country. I bet the insurmountable problems were absolutely overwhelming. But some way, somehow, they made it. And I bet it was a pretty heavy looking group sitting around in an auditorium uh, during the Civil War when this great country of ours was, was totally split up and families fighting against families and the insurmountable problems that we could never overwhelm, but some way, somehow, we did and we joined back together. And it was probably a pretty heavy group and the insurmountable problems of World War I and then the Depression sitting around and everybody seeing everything that ever worked for go down the drain and knowing this country would never regain the prosperity it's enjoyed. But we overcame those problems. World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the assassination of a president, Watergate, all the un insurmountable problems, somehow, some way, in our own clunky, clumsy way, with people like myself who don't know the answers, Somehow, we made it. And so, I'm really thoroughly convinced that, that as long as there are students and so as long as there's people such as yourselves who really want to see this country maintained and, and improved and the system improved, as long as there's people like yourselves who take the time to ask questions and get involved and knock on doors and work shopping centers and say, I want to know and I demand an answer and not throw your hands up and just say, it doesn't do any good and I quit, as long as there's people like yourselves who love this country with all its imperfections as much as I do and take the time to get involved, then I'm thoroughly convinced that 200 years from now we'll still be the greatest country this world has ever seen. Thank you for your questions and appreciate your hospitality today. As a token of appreciation for Congressman Beard coming to speak with us today, Phi Beta Lambda would like to present him with this uh, certificate of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I I'll say, you know, when I was elected to Congress, I, every time I get one of these, it's an experience for me, because when I was elected, I had never won anything in my life. Uh, I had never gotten, I was never a JC, and if you're a JC, you're guaranteed at least 100 awards or certificates. Uh, but I never got outstanding this or that. And when I first got elected, all I had on my wall was three autographed pictures of myself. <laughs> and, and so I do appreciate this. And let me just say, don't let the question stop here when I happen to come down. You know, when, as things develop, and there'll always be the crisis of the day, the cold strike or whatever, there'll always be something. Just for kicks, write me a letter. Write Sasser and Baker a letter. Compare the answers. Try to figure out which one's the form answer or which one maybe put some thought into it. Compare them. And then if you don't like the answer, if you think you got the runaround, then write them back. Say, I can't accept that answer. I think that's a bunch of hope. You know, I want to know more. Just for kicks. Just get in the habit. Do it a couple of times. See what happens. Or don't stop asking questions today. Thank you very much for the platform.